Hi, uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here with EdChat Interactive. I'd like to introduce Steve Piha. You, you may have seen him b before. I'm really curious to know where this picture came from. So I'm going to close the picture and I'm going to bring Steve up and maybe he'll clue us in. So I, I will. I'll be happy to clue you in. Hi, Mitch. It's great to see you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. I really appreciate seeing you. And uh, please, I always love it when you uh, ping me on the IM. I love to have uh, back channel conversations where we can just talk in front of the room. Um, that picture is a painting. It was a, a real day in class. I don't remember exactly where I was. I know I was in the Independence Missouri School District and I was working in a kindergarten classroom and I was just doing a regular writer's workshop day and that little boy was coming up and sharing and we were just doing sharing but uh, my host in the district that year was uh, a woman who ran Title I for, for Independence. Her name's Marilyn Lowry and she had the photo and about five years ago she started to take up painting and she's painted pictures of just about everybody in her family, her friends, teachers, and that was such to her such a precious picture of what interacting with small kids could be like in writing that I think it it moved her to 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 paint something like that. But I was very I, honored I, by it. So I, I love that picture because it just shows a, a connection between um, you know an adult and a kid. That um, yeah. it just it was very sweet. I I loved it. I, 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 I do too, and, and, and when she showed it to me, I did not remember the moment. She had to remind me of it. It would have been so long ago. So I'm going to bring myself down, and I'll bring your slides up. Okay? Great. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, here come some slides. There we are. I'm going to get myself out of the way of my own slides. Okay. Um, I'm going to do this just a little... Oh, interesting. Hey, Wow. Okay, so all my fonts seem to be different. I hope this works out. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, I'm going to do something a little different than I've done before, which is take a little, I've taken a longer time at the beginning, first half, and, and, and had to shorten up a little on the second half. I'm going to try to move pretty quickly through the first half, because all I want to do is, um, is introduce a, a, an idea and a theme here that I think makes teaching nonfiction writing a lot easier than it certainly it was for me a long time ago. And I, I think it's much easier than we've been doing it traditionally. And I want to know sort of in the discussion, short discussion for this, I want to get a sense of whether or not that I, you buy into that idea, whether that idea makes sense. Um, because that's what I'm, I'm hopefully trying to do here is I'm really trying to recast the teaching and learning of writing nonfiction as something we are already doing and know how to do, but that we're not recognizing and not putting the emphasis on. Um, so let's get started, Mitch. All right. So here's just the truth of it. We raise our kids on stories. There's a reason kids love narrative, and it's because we raise our kids on stories sometimes before they're born. We read to them every night. We talk to them. We tell them stories. We ask them how their day was. Everything is narrative uh, to kids. We raise kids on stories. That's why narrative starts. And there's a certain property of all of us human beings where we make up stories out of everything. A really good example is the question Mitch asked about that picture. He sees a picture, uh, a question occurs to him because he knows there must be a story behind it and he wants the story. He asks me and I tell him the story. I don't tell him that that's a glee clay, a glee clay print of a certain hyper-realistic style done by Mark, somebody in Kansas City who has three books out. I don't go into some big expository thing about it. I tell him the story. And that's generally how we communicate. And it's fundamental because we're human and we make stories up out of everything. So next slide. Narrative, this is why we make stories up out of everything or why we remember stories. Narrative information is psychologically privileged, privileged in the brain. That's in quotes because it's neuroscience talk or psychologist talk. All it means is that we are wired up, all things being equal, we will remember narrative information better than any other organization of information or type of information. Uh, 
I call this the narrative imperative. We have to make sure kids are really comfortable and strong with narrative because no matter what we do, that's where they're going to go first. Go to the next one, Mitch. All right, story writing and informational writing are more alike than we think. When we get into school, something strange happens, and it happens to all of us, and it's not anybody's fault. It's just what happens. We go from reading the newspaper or the magazine or a website on our phone in the parking lot, and the minute we walk inside the school, we divide up everything into tiny parts, and we do that with writing. Somehow, somewhere along the way, we went back to... I think it's the Greeks or Romans. We went back to the modes of discourse, and they are narr generally narrative, expository, persuasive, argumentative. And somehow we decided that it was good to split those up and teach them as separate things. And it's generally not a good idea. Um, I won't go into why, but it's generally not a good idea to split things up in unnatural ways. It makes some of them hard to learn. And what does it make hard to learn in this case? It makes all the non-narrative modes harder to learn. Because the truth of the matter is, is that narrative mode writing is a lot more like expository, persuasive, and argumentative mode writing than we think. And I'll show you how exactly how that works in just a moment. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's how it works. There was a wonderful study done. It's been repeated many times, and it may not be a big deal to you because it may just be what you've believed all your life, um, but it was a big deal to scientists. The question is this. If I have some information, in this case it's a little bit about uh, Galileo here and, and, and his telescope and the first time we could sort of understand what the surface of the moon was like, and I'm teaching science, is it better to present that information out of a textbook, say, in terms of an exposition, or is it better to present it as narrative? Now, the information never comes out of a textbook as narrative. It's almost science, almost always done through exposition. So what somebody did was they got two groups of kids. They gave kids this first piece, which is the expository text, and then I'll read it, and then we'll go to the next slide. You'll see the same information is in there, but it's rewritten as a narrative. And I call this storifying. It's a big technique that I think is really important that we should think about. So this is the expository version. This is like third, fourth grade stuff. With the Galilean telescope, we can see many details when we use it to look up into the night sky. I want you to notice third person there. The moon may look like a small, smooth ball of light covered with dark spots. I want you to notice that it says may look. It's conditional now. But on a closer look through this telescope, we can see deep valleys and great mountain ranges. Through the telescope, we can now see all the different marks on the moon's surface. And let's forget for a second the fact that that's terrible writing. Uh, most textbooks are. But you'll notice that it has two things about it that are, that are really hard to connect to. It's written in some sort of royal we or unroyal we. And, and that doesn't connect with kids. There's no we in this. I, can't, I'm not, I don't have a telescope. I can't see anything through it. I'm reading a book. And then there's this, this conditional language and uh, this thing that like, now I'm at the end of the paragraph and through the telescope, boy, now we can see all the different marks on the moon's surface. Fundamentally, this makes no sense. All right, because we can't see all the all the marks on the moon's surface because we're not looking through a Galilean telescope. Now, go to the flip the next slide. All right, now listen to this, and I'm sure it'll just sound much more natural. When Galileo looked through his new telescope, he could see the surface of the moon, and so he began his first close look into space. He slept during the day in order to work and see the moon at night. Many people thought that the moon was a small ball with a light of its own. Now that Galileo had a closer look through his telescope, he realized that the moon's surface had mountains and valleys. Now, the obvious thing to do is give kids passages like this, wait a week or two, and then test the two groups for recall. And they did this with several passages, all different science passages, one about Galileo, one about Marie Curie, all kinds of things. And every time they found out that the kids who read the narrative passage scored significantly higher on recall. And you can just tell by the way you're reading it. Galileo is a character here, and it's about him. It's not about 
us and we, it's his story. And we know how to follow stories as human beings. And it's just so much more naturally written and so much more the way adults talk to kids. Um, and I think that's why it works really well. So one of the things we're going to talk about is storifying and sort of the reverse of it, which is turning a story into uh, expository persuasive argument and material. But this is abs absolute actual science and it shows that the exact same information can be communicated in a narrative model and in an expository model. So information that we think about as factual, which we would normally think of being part of exposition, is here presented in narrative mode and it is presented much more effectively. So I find that to be a very interesting thing. Um, so let's move to the next one. All right, our success with informational writing depends on how we help kids connect to and progress from story writing. This is just a truth. A kid who has not done very well with story writing has almost zero chance of doing better with expository writing. They have even less of a chance of doing better than that with persuasive writing, and they will completely fail at argumentative writing. Because story is the natural thing, and we have to get good at story in order to use and leverage everything we know about story to get to the other modes of writing. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to say this is the best progression. This is the progression I've used for a long time, which is to say I work really, really hard with kids to make sure they are very good at personal narrative. I will not follow a pacing guide. I will not follow a preset curriculum. I will follow the kids. And what I need from the kids of every age, does not matter, all the way up to adult, everybody needs to be able to write a good personal narrative, a good story about what happened to me. The next thing is this hybrid thing where, where storification sometimes comes in. And I just call it an informational narrative. It's not an official term. It's something I made up. But there's a point at which kid is, te is telling a personal narrative. I'll tell you about one. Um, it's in my book. It's from a seventh grader a few years ago. She was writing about the wedding of her aunt when she was five years old. So it's from a five-year-old perspective, from like a 13, 14-year-old kid looking back. And the wedding happened to take place at a somewhat famous... Um, gathering place in our town. It's called the Horace Williams House. And one of the things I asked her, she didn't have this in the story at all, one of the things I asked her was, what's the big deal about the Horace Williams House? And she said, oh, you know, it's just where we have all the things. And I said, yeah, I know, but who is Horace Williams and why do we use his house and why do people like it and so on and so forth. And none, neither of us had the answer. And I said, go look something up on the internet or ask your parents or find out what the deal is on the Horace Williams house. And in a, in a version of the piece, she took a little bit of time to offer a, a paragraph or two within her narrative of factual information about the Horace Williams house. The other way to do that, that's more natural sometimes and is more like what we see in magazines and newspapers, is to do what's called a sidebar. It's where there's a small blocked out portion that is usually in a different mode or tells a different type of information than the main portion. So I might tell this kid to tell her narrative story and I'll say, give me a sidebar on the Horace Williams house. And then we'll separate out that factual information. But fundamentally, she's still telling a story about a wedding she went to. And I think that's a really important transitional stage is to find something within a personal narrative where you can pose a question and get a kid to put in a little bit of expository information. There's no such thing as a piece of writing that is all written in one mode. It doesn't exist. So uh, the next thing I try to do is get kids to move to expository writing. And I start again with personal information. Um, these are stories that usually come out of things kids like, don't like, have fun with, don't like to do. And they essentially have to explain them to us uh, before we can understand how they feel about them. I'd also like to mention at this time that expository writing is fundamentally identical to persuasive writing, which is fundamentally identical to argumentative writing. In expository writing, I try to write down some facts, and I hope you believe them. In persuasive writing, I try to write down an argument, which I contend is factual, and I try to get you to believe it. 
In argumentative writing, I compare my argument to the arguments of others. We make the assumption that all arguments are based on factual information and we evaluate them. So there's very little difference really in what's going on between expository persuasive and argumentative. There's only one thing kids have to learn how to do and that's how to support a logical argument. Informational narrative will have a, a little bit of, of challenge where kids have to support a logical argument. And even in personal narrative, if I ask kids the right questions for the right details, they will have to support a logical argument. For example, if they go on a trip and they say it's the best trip they've ever been on, I can ask them to prove that to me. Uh, I'll have to trust their facts, but I'll have to, I can ask them to prove that to be by making a little argument for why that last trip was the best one they'd ever had. Um, so this is a progression that I use, and I think, it is, I think it is a truism for all of us, including adults, and I think our writing curricula through the year should feature, at a minimum, these five types of writing but no one should move on to the next one until they've mastered the previous. And I think should kids should get a little bit of descriptive writing and a little shot at fiction here and there and some other things as a special projects. But really, I don't want to hear what I heard last month when I was working, doing some workshops in Missouri at a conference. And uh, a woman got up and asked about argumentative writing, said her kids were having a terrible time with it. And I said, tell me um, what your year has been looking like in writing. She said, well, we're working on argumentative writing. And I said, yeah, I know. You're just, you're just now asking me the question, but what other kind of writing have you done? How the kids she says, we're only doing argumentative writing. And I said, well, that doesn't make any sense because that's not how we learn to write. And she said, I know, but that's what they told us to do. And, and we're all under these pressures now. Obviously, what had happened at her school is they scored low on some test thing related to argumentative writing, and the principal got nervous and assigned all the teachers at a certain grade to teach the same type of writing over and over and over and over again. And by the time her kids got to the end of February, they didn't want to write anymore, because uh, I wouldn't want to either. So the, I really think this is a very healthy progression. Not only does it make sense developmentally, and I don't mean for age. I think it makes sense developmentally for skill set, because um, kindergartners can do all of these forms too, uh, modes too. But I, I really think we should think about, if not this progression in a school year, we should certainly think about a mix of all these types of writing throughout a school year. And if you remember from my previous session on revision, my, uh, my big takeaway from that is that we can get more learning in if we have kids write very short pieces. So even though there are five modes here, we might get kids to write 20, 30, 40 pieces in a year if we kept them short. That's the way to learn the most. All right, thanks, Mitch. Next slide. To be successful with informational writing, kids need to be successful with story writing first. That's just the basic truism. I, I just have never seen a kid, I should never say never, but I can't remember a kid who could write a great persuasive essay and could not tell a story from his or her life. Um, narrative comes first and kids really have to get good at it. The reason narrative is such a great type of writing to help kids become better writers is they don't need to worry about gathering any additional information. In theory, they have all the information in their head from their own experience, which means instead of spending time worrying about researching things or learning new things, they can spend all their time on techniques that lead to high quality writing. If, you, if I ever want to introduce a new technique in writing and it's not form or mode specific, I will go back to personal narrative every time and have kids write about something that's completely familiar. Off, often, sometimes they've, something they've already written about while well, I teach them a new technique. If I want to raise the quality of writing in my class, it doesn't matter what mode I want to raise it in, I go back to narrative so that kids can raise that level of skill in the type of writing that they feel most comfortable with. All right, next up. We have many opportunities every day to bridge the gap between story writing and informational writing. And right now in our schools, especially in the United States, we have a huge gap between what I call story writing, which is any narrative writing, and informational writing, which are the other three modes, expository, persuasive, and argumentative. There's a huge gap in the United States. It's just to say that over the last 30 years, we've gotten a little better at teaching narrative writing. And I think most teachers I work with can get kids out over a certain number of months to write a reasonable narrative. 
but there's a big leap into informational writing and there's almost a chasm to get over it. What we can do is build a little bridge every day. We can do the things I was talking about, about asking kids certain questions in their, in their narrative pieces to bring up informational detail and sometimes get them to do a little research or back up a claim, so on and so forth. I always look for those opportunities. But really where this comes in is in our reading. We're, we're going to be reading a lot of narrative to kids. I know we're trying to do a better balance now, but narrative, narrative texts still dominate uh, expository uh, persuasive argumentative texts. Kids get narrative all the time. We should think about all the opportunities we have to show kids, one, the logic that's going on in a narrative, because there's in, in, in good fiction, the logic of the story is really complicated. The second thing we should do is point out to kids when writers switch modes. How often, we see this all the time, how often a writer brings you to a setting and introduces that setting with no characters, simply describes what's there, why it's there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's essentially moving into the narrative has stopped. No time is passing. No characters are doing anything. The writer switches into exposition just briefly until he or she brings the characters back and the narrative continues. We have opportunities to point out how rich narrative writing is. We also, we also have persuasive and argumentative moments that come up in story writing. Usually they come up though at the level of theme. You can take even an old fairy tale nursery rhyme, Three Little Pigs, Tortoise and Hare, and there is always a theme or main idea, depending on how you like to look at it. Um, tortoise and Hare is a good one. Theme is probably perseverance, and the main idea or the moral of the story is usually slow and steady uh, wins the race, I think it is. So I might ask kids about slow and steady, or I might ask kids about perseverance. And I might ask them to tell me about something that was really hard for them that they got through. And then I might ask them to talk about what, what it means to persevere. And then we might actually look up something on the internet and start to get some factual information about what, what persevering is all about and what it takes. And we'll get down and talk about this, all this stuff about grit and all these kinds of things. Pretty soon we'll be talking entirely in terms of exposition. And I find that the themes in fiction are very rich for bringing, out of, bringing them out of the story and talking about exposition, as are certain details in a story, um, especially if it's realistic fiction. There will be some details which you can bring out of the story and into the real world that kids are fascinated about. Um, when I was in fifth grade, sixth grade, we read Sounder, and I swear all we wanted to know was know about dogs. And it would have been just so easy for our teacher to switch, switch us right over into doing dog study. And we would have loved it. So there's, there's lots of ways to bridge the gap. And we should always be bridging it. We should never really tell kids to expect one mode of text. Because one, texts with one mode don't exist. Next slide, please. All right. So this is, an, this is yet another way I get kids to kind of meet me halfway. Um, I usually let them write a story, and this is just a blurb of the story. And then once they've written the story, I take the subject of the story, and I ask them to write an article on it, which is basically an informational piece or an expository piece. But since they've also, always, also all, already written the story about it, I know they know a lot about it and don't mind studying it. So this is, a fic, this is fiction. It's a little, imagine it's a back of the jacket, back of the book blurb. Uh, Damon Williams is about to become a high school football star. He's so big, so fast, and so smart that he's destined to go on to college and probably even the pros. But anger and confusion over his parents' recent divorce drive him toward a distant, a different destiny, reuniting with the father who has always supported his athletic aspirations. In a frantic 24-hour search from the suburbs to the heart of the city, Damon encounters many unusual characters. Their cryptic wisdom finally sinks in, and he learns the secret his father has hidden from him all his life. Whoa! So that's a typical uh, kind of story kids love. Imagine that was the narrative. Now, if you will, Mitch, switch to the next one. 
All right, here's an article, and it's all about football, and it's about the in football right now. If you like football and you like reading stories or telling stories about football, you're going to know about this issue. A team of neurologists examining the brains of deceased NFL football players discovered that 96% of them had significant damage due to repeated trauma associated with concussions. Multiple concussions increase the risk of CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy which has been linked to suicide and related issues, including memory loss and depression. In a sport where head-to-head -head competition is more than just a catchphrase, fewer kids are being allowed to play. Does the discovery of the long-term risks, health risks of playing football hint at the demise of our nation's most popular sport? Now, that would probably be a middle school or high school kid writing, but that is an awesome opening paragraph to a novel, uh, sorry, to an article that is about exactly the same topic as the story the kid would have written out as a narrative. Um, I could even propose to the kid, if he's writing fiction, that Damon and his mother or his father have some argument about whether he can continue to play football when this new news comes out. And you can back in a lot of science here and a lot of exposition, um, so content knowledge and, and modal writing. Um, really piggybacking or bridging from the story a kid would like to write. So move on, Mitch, please. Thank you. All right, I call this a starticle. It's a story, plus I get the kid to write an article. And they're not going to choose to write an article until I start reading articles to them and telling them what articles are. And when I say article, I really just mean that basic form of short form information writing that you would see in a newspaper, a magazine, or on a, web, or on a website, typically a news website or a, a commentary website of some kind. But I can get them to write a story, and out of that, I'll get them to write an article usually in expos an expository mode article, and I just call it a starticle. And after a while, I can just ask kids to write a starticle, and they'll write two pieces for me. And I think this is really when I know they're ready to go. They really get it. They see the connection between narrative and non-narrative modes, and they can, they can move between them pretty facilely, pretty easily. All right, next slide. So, here we go. There are lots of ways to bridge the gap, and I really do, that's been very, very helpful for me in, in this, is think of this as a gap for kids. They grow up as narrative beings, and all of a sudden, in school, we need to turn them into expository thinkers and reasoners and persuasive arguers, and these are things that are not unnatural to kids, but that are intellectually much more challenging. So there's there's, there's a gap here that has to be bridged. One way to do it is storifying information. So if you're over in a content area, you can teach kids how to storify. And I've had some success with this, where we'll take an entire textbook uh, full of chapters and articles and whatever, and whatever it comes up with, each kid writes a little story about each little chunk. And we all find that the information is much more palatable and much easier to remember. So you can storify information in your class. You can actually include, as we talked to, you can actually include information in story writing. Just ask the kid to write a sidebar about something or to explain something with exposition that occurs, uh, is related to an occurrence in the story. We can provide also stories inside of informational writing. If you ever, each of us knows the term anecdote, and I often tell kids that an anecdote, a short story that is meant to, uh, to support as an example a particular uh, position or type of idea, that an anecdote is the perfect way to start an informational piece. Almost always uh, in uh, news magazine articles and often on uh, television and radio, uh, a story, and then, uh, what is overtly a nonfiction informational story starts out with a little bit of narrative, a tiny little story or a little anecdote. And I love it when kids learn to do that. Um, one kid, a fourth grader once called anecdotes exposa stories because they were stories that supported his, his expository argument. And then there's starticle writing. These are four things that I've done and had a lot of success with and, and have helped me bridge that gap. And here we are kind of at the first break. And Mitch, flip the next slide. I want to do this pretty quick. But here's, here's something to talk about for two seconds and maybe ping me in the IM. 
across every subject and every grade, how many different ways can can we, as a group of people, think about bringing story writing together with informational writing? That, to me, is the key to bridging the gap. So I've, I've given you four to think about. What are some ways maybe you've done this already to bridge the two together? Um, so Mitch, that's our, that's our discussion topic for the next couple of minutes. And I hope, uh, oh, I got, a full, I, I got a full IM window. Oh, thank you, Patrick. He's talking, he make, Patrick makes a point here that uh, Steinbeck at the beginning of Grapes of Wrath um, has to give us an extraordinary amount of what is effectively factual information about what, uh, what the Dust Bowl uh, experience was like. And uh, it actually takes quite a while to get to the Joad family and their story. He's really talking in general about the Okies and how, why they had to leave and what the conditions were like. And I think that's a really, really good example of pointing out to kids that this is basically a really good report inside of one of the great novels of all time. So thank you, Patrick. That is perfect. Anybody else? Talk amongst yourselves and chime in in the room window here and give us some other ideas for bridging the gap between narrative and non-narrative writing. Oh, Ann Laurie, excellent. She's had students write stories uh, and assigned a motion graph. A lot, I've just I've been studying this in a lot of professional writers. They, they do graph and chart uh, the action of their stories, particularly they graph and chart multiple characters against each other. Um, and I like that a lot, motion graph of a story. Um, writing about history, of course. Any, you, can, you can have kids, history, I always try to remember, remind kids, it's got the word story in it. Now, that's not the root of history. History comes from the Latin histor, knowledge, but Kids don't know this. I just tell them history is all about one big story, and that's the way I like to talk about it with them. So that's uh, an excellent, excellent way to bridge the gap there. Thank you, Gail. Any others? I'm trying to think of something else here. Hmm. Okay, Mitch. And yeah, you know, go I, on. oh, okay. Because I was thinking, as you're yeah, as you're ahead. as you're telling this, you know, some of the things that that um, were thought of as facts long ago um, that we still mm -hmm. remember are the myths, and the myths were a way of explaining natural phenomenon in stories and in story form. And, right, yes. and even though we've since proved the science behind myth, you know, the, the the science that refutes the information in, in many of the myths, it was a way of transferring what was the, the, the knowledge base of a whole civilization mm -hmm. from generation to generation. Why? Here's a question for you, Mitch. Why was that information, why did that information have to be communicated narratively? As It could have been communicated expositorily very easily. Why did they bother with long stories? Well, you know, and I'll go back to the Bible also. It's because we're story-making right. machines. Story. Okay. We are story-making machines, and, and our narrative is psychologically privileged. So if you want somebody to remember something, even if it's factual information, and especially if, if you're working in an oral tradition where we're not going to be able to pick it up and read what Dr. Mitch told us tonight, <laughs> tomorrow, um, we will have to have remembered it. And uh, uh, the best way to, to talk to people so they remember things is through narrative. That's right. why I and, tell stories, and also because I like to talk. And and <laughs> you know, and politicians are masters. The good, you know, I want to say good politicians, not necessarily a politician that you agree with or you disagree with, but but a politician who's successful is especially yes. good at spinning a especially story behind what he or she down. is trying to get through. That's right. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you all right now. If you ask my wife, who's a professional freelance writer, what every one of her clients wants, and they're all business clients. They all want story. They give her a bunch of facts and they say, can you make this into a story? Can you find a story here? Because that's the information we want to put out to people. So story is one of the biggest things right now in marketing, in um, corporate strategy. Um, and it comes at a time, the, pop, the popularity of story and narrative in the work world comes at a time when we are almost all but banishing narrative from the world of school. And that's just the way it often is, but I really think there's a good case to be made for a lot more narrative work than we're doing. 
Uh, Kelly Gallagher also thinks so too. All right, let's go right on and I'm gonna show you the strategies that help us get this done. All right, so the foundation of all writing, which means that if you, and I said, I've said this a couple times before, but it bears repeating. All writing breaks down, narrative, whatever, breaks down to a, to a sets of ideas and details. An idea and then some supporting information. So idea details is the pattern of all writing. And the next time you look at a, at a text, just break it down. So here's, a, here's the idea details strategy. And on the one, the right, on the left side, I'm writing here about, uh, oh, VR game technology. This would be similar to what a seventh or eighth year old kid, a seventh or eighth grade kid would, would probably want to do. Um, I, the idea is that new gaming technology makes even today's most exciting video games seem boring, blah, 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 blah. And then here's a bunch of details. Virtual reality is coming. The imaginarious VR system, that's just Oculus, basically, without me getting in trouble with Facebook. And haptic feedback, you'll see in the next one, so you can feel what's happening. And, and the general prediction that within a few, just a few years, we won't be holding on to game controllers anymore sitting on the couch. We'll be standing up and walking around and, and getting force feedback uh, through uh, certain kinds of body wear. Um, and, and the idea of video games will really be uh, extended into virtual reality. So let's go to the next page and we can look. All I have to do is really take the idea and the details, put them in order, and I get a nice little paragraph of expository prose. New gaming technology that makes even today's most exciting video games seem boring will soon be available at prices consumers can afford, right off the idea. Virtual reality will change everything about the way we experience, ga experience gaming. The Imaginarius VR system will be available within a year for less than $500. Imaginarius VR will feature haptic feedback. This means you'll be able to feel what's happening while you're inside a virtual reality environment. Experts think that within five years, we won't be sitting on our couches with game controllers. We'll be standing up and moving around in 3D worlds we could see, touch, and feel. Now, that may not be the greatest writing in the world, but that's a pretty complete bit of reasoning. And you could argue that it has a, a couple of persuasive elements in it. You could argue that it has a couple of unsupported comments in it. You could argue for more details to support a particular point. But if a kid just wrote that, I would be really happy if they wrote it that well. Because I can just say, that's a whole piece. You did it. Show me the idea and how the details line up. Oh, the imaginary system will change everything about the way we experience in gaming? What do you mean by that? And I can have the kid pull that part out on the idea side and have them come up with some details. And they can get a second paragraph, and a third paragraph, and a fourth paragraph, and a fifth paragraph. And with one strategy, I can just keep pulling parts out that I need to know more about and that they'll have to support with more logic. And that is really all we need kids to be able to do to be good expository writers, to be good persuasive writers, and to be good argumentative writers. But we'll keep going with more strategies. Let's go to the next one. All right, there is something I call the universal sequencer. Whether we're writing narrative, expository, persuasive, or argumentative writing, it always comes in a sequence. This is really the overlay of narrative. We, as human beings, don't really read very effectively out of order, and writers don't write very effectively out of order. Even Tim Berners-Lee, in his excitement about hypertext, uh, realized many years later that doing a link from one story to another story to another story actually breaks the thread of comprehension every time you leave and join and enter into a new context. Um, so there's always a linear sequence, um, unless you're writing in postmodern. And I have a strategy here that I've used for a long time. It's for story writing, it's for narrative, it's called transition action details. But when I show you that it's the same virtually for informational writing, I'll just flip the middle column from action to idea. Let's go to the next example. All right, we'll read this one down, but this is a summer vacation story. Top line, top row. Uh, last summer, I went on vacation with my family. Details, we go almost every year, it's fun. I get to do a lot of exploring with my dog. On the third day, I was walking with my dog along a cliff. We were up about 75 feet. And you can see that this sounds pretty much like any kid's typical story. It has transitions, it has action steps, and each of the action steps is supported with details. Notice if I were to put my hand up over the transition column, it would, and I changed action to idea, I'd have a bunch of stacked idea details charts. So again, this is just proof that idea details is the fundamental strategy or structure of all written language. Moving right along. 
So this is writing it up off the chart. Last summer, I went on vacation with my family to the ocean. We go almost every year. It's fun because there's a lot to do. I especially enjoy exploring with my dog, and so on and so forth. All the kid has to do is run right across the row and write each row into a paragraph or two, and the story comes out just fine as long as the transitions, actions, and details are fine. All right, that's, that's how we do a narrative with that strategy. Here's how we do an expository piece with it. Um, I just changed the action column to idea because we're not talking about a sequence of events. We're talking about a sequence of ideas now. So the basic idea here is the effect of technology on um, note taking. And um, it starts off, uh, technology has had an unexpected effect on note taking in school. Well, what's that about? Students who take notes on computers remember less information. Hmm. People thought computers would help students by enabling to take more notes. Studies show that students with computers do take more notes than those who take notes by hand. But using computers for note-taking purposes causes two problems. Computer use takes students' attention away from learning because they're always checking their email or doing Facebook or whatever. And students take too many notes. It turns out that the very thing we gave computers to kids to do is a thing that defeats their ability to take notes. Students with computers focus on, oh, here's all you read the transition here. Because students can type faster than they can write by hand, students with computers focus on capturing almost every piece of information possible. This defeats the purpose of note taking. Writing by hand limits the amount of information students can record. Therefore, students have to be more selective. They have to do more logical processing of the information to get only the stuff they really need. So this is one of those ironic things about technology. This, is, this article has been written a hundred times. Uh, by now, um, but this is a very common thing. It's exactly the same strategy as we did before, but instead of a progression of events, I just have a progression of ideas. And again, if you pull your hand up and cover up the transition column, you'll see that it's really just a bunch of idea details uh, charts stacked up on each other in a certain order with some transitioning language to move between them. All right, let's go right along. And here it is. The increased use of new technology in education has had an unexpected effect, blah, 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 blah. I fill this out exactly the way I fill out the narrative. So back to my point about getting really good at narrative. If I can get a kid to use the transition action detail strategy to write a flawlessly paragraphed personal narrative more than one time, I can get them almost immediately to do an expository piece with ideas as the middle column because they're doing exactly the same thing. There won't, it won't feel any different to them. They may just need to get some new information for the details. And that's what I tell them. I said, look, kids, if you, if you can't think of the right idea or you're missing a couple of details, that's stuff you have to learn. So instead of writing the answer in the box, write the question that you have to go get the answer to. And when you get the answer, substitute that for the question and then write your piece. It becomes very easy when we move from TAD, transition action details, to TID, transition idea details. All right, move right along, Mitch. Thank you. So there's another universal strategy. I just call it the universal logician. This is a universal structure of all logical reasoning. What, why, how? What do you think? So what's your thesis or your opinion? Why do you think that? Give me some, give me some reasons. But how do you know you're right? Give me the proof. Give me the evidence. And if we match this up and add in what I call the three E's of strong support, I can tell kids, look, there are three kinds of things you can put in the how column. You can put examples, like anecdotes. You can put explanations, which are further reasons for reasons. This, I have this reason why the, I think the moon is made of green cheese. And here's how I want to explain it to you. And then there's evidence, usually scientific evidence, statistical evidence, or some kind of evidence, and I explain evidence just like, I, just like I would in a court of law. Evidence is like an exhibit that one side presents to the court so that it can be verified independently of the person presenting it. That's the difference between evidence versus explanation and example. In explanation and example, I have to take the writer's word for it. With evidence, I can go verify it myself if I want to. Moving right along. So now, here's uh, something about the cost of college. I think this is like a college, a high school freshman. 
Um, and you'll see that this follows the what, why, how format. The thesis is if we want more kids to go to college, college has to cost less money to go to. And we all know the drill on this. College costs have been going up faster than inflation for a long time. Well, that's a nice statement, and I believe it, and you probably believe it, but it would be really nice to have some evidence. So here's some evidence. In the past 10 years, costs went up 3.4% per year beyond inflation. And in the past 20 years before that, costs went up 4.2% year beyond inflation. And that information comes from the college board. So at least I can go look, up, look it up in an article from the college board and then decide if I trust them or not. This is evidence. Now look at the next one. College students pay, need too many loans to pay for their education. Well, that's just an unverified statement, though it is explanatory. It is a good explanation of the problem. Now the writer mixes two kinds of ease together. The first is another explanation. Some students owe so much money they can't pay their bills. That's not evidence. But now here's some evidence. The average amount of money BA graduates owe is almost $32,000. And where does that come from? The Wall Street Journal. Okay? So that's the idea. What, why, how? The, th the thing that makes this powerful is this works for any kind of argument in Western culture that you can think about. If you want to get, if you want to get your principal to give you a day off to go to a conference, make up a thesis, give, give him or her a reason, and come up with two or three uh, pieces of support. Uh, an example, oh, uh, three of my friends from the other district went to the, the, the training and, and they thought it was just fantastic and they came back able to do A, B, and C. Or um, um, people who get this kind of training usually improve blah, 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 blah. Or um, the district across the state all had this training and their test scores went up 18%. You know, you can give somebody that kind of information and oftentimes they'll just give in and give you what you want simply because your, your, your logic is so strong. Um, and so uh, this can be used for any kind of argument, which means it can be used for straight up informational writing expository. It can be used for persuasive writing. And of course, it can be used for argumentative writing. So you could live on just the transition action details, transition IDTL strategy, or you could live on just the what, why, how strategy with the three E's. They both would get all the forms of writing done. Let's go to the next one, Mitch. All right, that's just the write up from it. Same way the other charts work. Start at the top left, move right to left, move top to bottom. All right, you go to the next one. Now this is like this was this new strategy, a content purpose audience. This is the one that that most mo, most professionals use. That is to say, people in the world of work. Uh, my wife uses it entirely in her business. She has literally thousands of people using this strategy across the world right now. Um, it's called content purpose audience, and just to define it, I define content as the main idea and the details. The purpose is what we want people to think and do or do at the end of the the. Uh, of the piece and the audience we think of as a specific person or group of people and the questions they would need answered about our topic in order to be persuaded by it. So let's go to the next one. We'll see what the chart looks like. Here's the way I draw the chart. You can also draw the chart horizontally. Um, this is a neat thing. There's a nice, I, I won't go through reading the next story because it's a long, but I will send you the slide deck. It's a really nice essay of a kind that I get often when I am working at about eighth or ninth grade, when girls in particular, although boys have started to chime in on this too, really start to feel the pressure to dress a certain way or to have their hair done a certain way. With kids, with guys, it's often like tennis shoes or jackets or something like that. But it's all about judging people from the outside based on you know how they style their hair and what they wear and what the, what the social and emotional consequences of that would be. But you can see that she's got a statement. We're all too concerned about how we look. She's got some details. She's got what she wants you to think and do at the end, and then she knows she's writing about middle school and high school kids, and she has, importantly, the three questions here that she knows she's going to get asked. Isn't it normal to want to look nice? Seems normal to me. Isn't how we want to look a way we express ourselves? That's huge for kids at this age. And how do we change this, this way of thinking about each other, this judgmental surface way, if it's something we've all grown up with and we hardly even know we're doing it? Those are tough questions. She's got to answer them in the essay. Go to the next slide, Mitch, please. This is a great, great essay. I'm not going to read it uh, any more than the first paragraph, but I encourage you when I send you the slide deck just to read the whole thing because it's really nicely done. Every day we are told that how we look is who we are. 
Magazines, TV shows, movies, websites, and many other sources encourage us to buy and wear cool clothes or to cut our hair in trendy ways. They also tell us that the choices we make about our appearance are very important and we believe it. If, if you're of a mind to teach kids how to really punch the end of a paragraph, there's a little technique here that I do all the time. I, I, just, I just call it a wrap up. It's a way of wrapping up by breaking a, a strict grammar rule. And we believe it is not a complete sentence. It's actually an add-on clause uh, to the previous sentence. So there would be a comma and then and we believe it. But by putting the period there, you get a little separation and it gives more emphasis to and we believe it. And it's a really effective way to, to punctuate a thought. And you'll see it all the time in contemporary writing. So anyway, uh, Mitch, go through the next two or three slides. This story runs, I think, four screens. It's a very, very good persuasive article. Go to the next one. And one more, I think, will be done. All right, there we go. Now, the hardest kind of writing that we have to teach kids to do, and it is really hard, but it's also the kind of writing that they really need to be able to do for college, and you have to be able to do this on the job. You cannot, you cannot last six days in a, in a job without being able to do this, um, because you have to make arguments for things or argue against things all the time. and You have to do it in a certain way. Um, so let's go to the next screen. Argumentative writing. This is a definition of argumentative writing. It's not a dictionary definition. It's the one I use because it seems to me to be the one that is closest to the truth and it's one that kids can easily understand. It, argumentative writing is the presentation of your argument. So what is that? That's just persuasive writing in relation to the arguments of others. So all we're doing here is taking a kid, and this is what I mean by pr pr developmental progression. All we're doing here is taking a kid who can write a good persuasive essay and have them evaluate two or three other persuasive arguments and make an evaluative decision about which argument is better. That's really all we're doing. So whether or not kids know what argumentative writing is or not, if they can write persuasive, they have all the skills to do it. And it turns out that if they can write expository, they have all the skills they need to write persuasive. And if we bridge from narrative to expository, we find that if they have narrative down, they really have all the strategies they need for expository. So if we backtrack this all the way, you come back to the same conclusion I have after 20 years, which is that narrative is the foundation and kids have to get good at narrative. So this is a screen that I often show to kids. Down the middle are your three choices, TAD, transition action details, idea details, what, why, how, or uh, content purpose audience. That's how you're going to write the main thrust of your story. Around the edges are little idea details things. These are things I tell kids to use to evaluate the arguments of others. What is that person's main idea? What are the two or three details that support that? So I can actually just show this picture to a group of kids, or you can take this picture away and I say, kids, pick one from the middle. That's how you're going to write the essay. But I want you to make sure you use an idea details to analyze any other argument that you're looking at to talk about as you go through the middle. Um, if you think about this for a second, because we've done this in, a, in sort of a progressive way, this looks complicated, but in fact, I've taught all this information in half a year to second graders. They're not that good at it. They don't write big, long pieces for the Wall Street Journal, but they can understand each one of these strategies and they can learn how to write a what, why, how, very short, and they can also analyze a short argument in an idea details and tell me which one is better. And I can walk around with just this on a piece of paper, or I can do one myself as a model and fill it in on a bigger piece of paper. So all these, all these, these columns and boxes are filled in. But this is it right here. This is the universal structure of argumentation. All you have to do to get out of high school, succeed in college, get a master's degree and a PhD, and go to work for a tech company and make a bazillion dollars is learn what's on this one page. And that is the end of tonight's presentation, I think. Do I have another screen there, Mitch? Aha. Now that you all have the foundational tools you need to craft any kind of nonfiction writing, Good question. What else do you need to feel confident about helping kids become great nonfiction writers 
other than a question mark that I should have had on that last uh, sentence. What do you need other than this stuff? Now's the time to, um, to pop questions in on the, uh, on the uh, IM window. I'm making it larger. Thank you, Anne, for your comment there. And Patrick says his wife, who is a marketer, uh, will attest to the same things I've just said in marketing. And you're right, Patrick. This is this is very common marketing strategy stuff. And it's not an accident that my wife, the writer, is hired now more by marketing departments than she is by any other type of organization. All right. So let's hear it. Questions. What do you need? What, do, what did I miss? What did I go over too fast? What don't you buy into here? Anything I can help you with? Thoughts? Questions? Anything at all? Are the Warriors going to win 73 tonight? <laughs> what was the first foundation of all writing? Oh, uh, uh, that's Anne. It's idea plus details, Anne. If you think about even, um, even just basic narrative writing, um, usually the, a paragraph, we often... In the, in the old days, we called them topic sentence paragraphs. Um, we still have them, but uh, we know that writing doesn't follow that format. But essentially, every time I make a statement as a, as a writer, uh, the reader has the right, uh, and in fact, even the reflex, to pose a question, which I would have to ask for a detail. So if I say the idea details pattern is the foundational pattern of all writing, you have the right to ask the question that you just did, in which I have to give you more details to explain it. And that becomes a paragraph. Uh, Curry and company will do it. Patrick says that the Warriors will win 74 and break the record. <laughs> it's, I, I just want you guys to know, in, on any, uh, if you're not on the East Coast, the game starts at 1020 tonight for us on the East Coast. All right, more, any more questions? Uh, so, so good. I have, I have a question. I have a question. Yes, and because if I'm looking at the, I'm actually looking at the chart over here on my other screen, and I see the, you know, the transaction, uh, transition action detail, and I'm thinking, yes. you know, as as a transition with kids, and, and coupling this up with with what you taught us last time about revision, you could have kids start off with just a simple, okay, I want you to do an an action and some details, and then a transition, and then another action, and then some details, and then put that into mm -hmm. an essay. Then you could either yes, have exactly kid. it builds a story really fast. Now the way I often do that one, uh, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, then I was going to say from there you could either have other kids or yourself then come up Sorry, with some questions. Sorry, I didn't hear you there. On, oh, can you not hear me? Um, am I? Can, I'm I'm hoping other people can hear me. Um, no, I got you. That's exactly right. Okay. I was just come just chime okay. in. That's exactly it. Okay, I got you. Okay, so so once once you have that very simple uh, thing, then, <laughs> then last time you talked about uh, you know getting kids to uh, interested in revising, and by having either the teacher or the other kids ask questions, then okay. you're filling in with some of the other uh, techniques that you've that you've taught tonight, and the kids slowly build up into a real. Uh, longer, you know, narrative or expository type, you know, uh, document that, that, that they have. And you can go through that, you know, you can go, you can iterate that quite a few times, correct? That's right. That's right. And if you've ever had trouble with kids getting off topic, what I do to stop that is I have them fill in the first action box. And then the second thing I have them do is fill in the last action box so that everything else that goes on the chart stays on the same topic. Ah, okay. That's very really good. Helpful too. And then I do exactly what Mitch just said. Mitch, how come you know how I teach this? Uh, just lucky, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> just lucky, I guess. All right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, it's just, it's so logical, and I, you know, I I didn't necessarily know it before, but I paid attention as you were talking, and it was like you got you got my wheel spinning. It's it's really it's great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's exactly what happens in class. Kids figure it out after a while, too, and then it kind of runs on its own. And that's when I feel great about it. <laughs> yeah. OK, so, um, you know, I, I guess we're we're coming to the end of the night. It's it's after it. You know, it's after the hour and you know, we will record this. 
uh, so everybody can get a copy and we will get you copies of the slides so that uh, so that you'll have them for reference and uh, yep. we may do a, a few more sessions on writing over the summer and um, and really pick Mitch, up uh, and let's ask, do a let's, course. Maybe what I'll do, uh, sorry to interrupt, but we're trying, Mitch and I are trying to figure out how, where to continue. And I, I have many different things I can talk about, writing, reading, assessment, motivation, et cetera. And I think what I'll do when I send the email out to you is ask you for your feedback to me about okay. what other topics you might like to see me cover. Does that sound mm -hmm. good, Mitch? Sounds great. Perfect. Okay, so I'll, I'll Perfect. pose that question in the follow-up email. Good. Okay. So, okay. yeah, Steve, All you right. and I will be talking sometime in the next uh, couple weeks. And uh, so see you see you soon. I hope. Uh, are you a Warrior fan? Or is that why you were you brought that up? Uh, you know, I'm really not. But this is history, right? I mean, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you gotta okay. be there for it. Okay, we'll just root for the Mets. <laughs> That's all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> it's baseball season. Okay, Steve. Uh, right. Talk to you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, take Mitch. take care. Thanks, and. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. It was another really interesting session. I hope you can join us next week and, uh, and in following weeks for some more uh, EdChat Interactive events. Take care and talk to you all soon. Bye.